Resuming debate, the Honourable Member Barry Innisfil. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker, and uh, I am uh, glad to rise on behalf of the residents of Barry Innisfil and the businesses of Barry Innisfil to speak to Bill C-59, the fall economic statement. Madam Speaker, uh, I remember uh, four kids, I remember when they were growing up, there was a show on TV called Barney the Dinosaur. And one of the famous songs in Barney uh, was, if all of the raindrops were lemon drops and gum drops, oh, what a rain that would be. And if you listen to the Liberals debating the fall economic statement and anything to do with their economic policy, uh, you would think that Canadians have never had it any better, that things are rosy across the land. Well, I can tell you, Madam Speaker, after spending the last six weeks in Barry Innisville, speaking to residents, speaking to businesses, uh, things are dire right now. And they're dire for many reasons for a lot of families, and that's what I'm going to be focusing on, just what I heard from my residents and businesses of Barry Innisfil over the last six weeks. And in fact, I've been hearing from them for a long time, because many of the economic policies that this government has implemented has disproportionately affected Barry Innisfil residents and businesses in a way that many of them may never recover from. And the first thing uh, that I want to focus on is the carbon tax. Uh, we live an hour north of Toronto. We don't have access to mass transit like they do in the city of Toronto. We have a Barry Transit system. We have a Go Transit system that gets us where we need to go for special events in Toronto, for example, or from point A to point B in Barry. The difficulty for many people who live in Barry is they actually drive. So they're being impacted by the cost of the carbon tax on their gas bills as they go to work, as they go to visit family, as they take their kids to hockey. And in many cases, hockey doesn't just happen in Barrie, it happens all over the place, all over Ontario. And I know that firsthand, having uh, two kids that played AAA hockey, that I would be in Peterborough. Well, think, I, you know, my wife and I often talk about that circumstance where she would be in Belleville, I would be in Peterborough, uh, both separately with our, with our kids playing hockey, and the impact that the carbon tax would have had on us as a family at that time. We could barely afford to put our kids in hockey at the time. I can't imagine what families are going through right now having to pay the carbon tax on their fuel and everything else, home heating, Madam Speaker. Uh, you know, whether it's residential or businesses, I, I, got a, I got a bill sent to me today from a local business. His carbon tax just last month, just last month, it's a restaurant, was 1400 and $31. Now let's assume for a second that this same restaurant works off of 10 percent margins. They'd have to sell $14,000 worth of more goods or services that they supply in order to just pay for the carbon tax. And the fact is that the carbon tax is going to quadruple, so they're going to have to pay more. And they're certainly not, as a business, getting of that, any of that back in a rebate. As many families are showing me their, their gas bills, and I'm asking them, Madam Speaker, for their gas bills, and they're saying the same thing, that I am not getting back in totality what I'm paying for gas, what I'm paying for natural gas, what I'm paying in groceries, I am not getting back what the carbon rebate, as the government claims, is an equal amount to what they're actually paying in the carbon tax. And in fact, Madam Speaker, the parliamentary budget officer spoke about exactly that, that many more families are getting less back in the rebate than they're paying in carbon tax, and it's disproportionately affecting low-income Canadians, and many of them uh, are in my writing of Barry Innisfil. Now, Madam Speaker, I uh, have, uh, as we all have, sent out uh, newsletters and mailers, and we have the ability to ask a question in the back of that mailer. And there was no other issue, no other issue that I received more responses from than on the issue of the carbon tax. And the question was simple. Do you support the carbon tax? And here are some of the responses that I got back. And I'll tell you that, uh, that out of the hundreds and hundreds of responses that I got back from Barry Innisfil residents and businesses, 82.5% of them said that they don't support the carbon tax. 15% said yes, and 25 had no responses in that. And these were hundreds, Madam Speaker, of responses that were sent back. And some of the comments, and there's an option to, to give comments there. What are, what are they doing with the tax, said DB in Barrie. 
I'd be interested about what improvements our carbon tax collected has made on the climate change so far. And we've already heard, Madam Speaker, through various reports that our, our targets, our emissions have not been reduced significantly, save and except for during COVID. Well, that stands to reason, because nobody was driving and nobody was doing anything at that time. The economy was effectively shut down. We need to do much more to stop climate change, but I don't believe that the carbon tax in Canada is doing anything to change it. The carbon tax on home heating is unfair. Uh, HH and Innisfil don't believe it effectively encourages less consumption. The government has no idea what goes on in a real country for the average person, said Dee Morrison and Barry. I pay 62% in pension, in tax. It's obvious to me that this money is not being spent in my best interests. And now we hear that the government, because they, they feel like they've got a narrative problem on the carbon tax, is effectively going to try to put lipstick on a pig. They're going to change that narrative. They're going to try to advertise it in a way that more people understand it. Well, I can tell you, Madam Speaker, people do understand it. And they understand when they see their gas bill, and they understand when they go to the grocery store, they understand when they put gas in their car, that the carbon tax is costing them more. When you tax the farmer that produces the food, you tax the shipper that moves the food, you tax the producers and wholesalers who look after the food for distribution, you tax the grocery stores, who ends up paying more, Madam Speaker? And that's the consumer. And how bad is it in this country? Two million people are using food banks. I had an opportunity last week to visit the Berry Food Bank. They were telling me that their utilization is 150% greater, was 150% greater in December than it was in the December before. They're seeing people use the food bank like they've never seen before, Madam Speaker. And it's multi-generational as well. Families are coming in utilizing the food bank like it's a grocery store because they can't afford their food. In fact, uh, I was also at the Innisfil Food Bank, and before that, and this is what precipitated my visit to the Innisfil Food Bank, in addition to the fact that we donated uh, $1,312.50 to the food bank as a result of uh, uh, some fundraising that we did specifically for the food bank, this is from the director. I finished the yearly report for the Innisfil Food Bank, so I'm sharing some of the stats here. We've seen an overall increase of 29% over the course of the year, which is consistent or even, even less than what we're seeing across the country. The majority, 43% of our visitors, attended the food bank between two and five times this year. 24% of our clients came six to 12 times per year. Our busiest months were October, our highest ever, and January, which is pretty standard, over 55% of our people are supporting dependents. Again, that multi-generational use. We're seeing an increase in multi-generational homes. This means that someone is supporting both children and parents or grandparents and are supporting their own kids, but also their grandkids. This, Madam Speaker, is in a G7 country where we're supposed to have abundance, where people are not just simply supposed to get by or scrape by, they're supposed to have the dignity of work, the dig dignity of producing a paycheck, and the dignity of providing for their family. And that is sadly not happening. And what we've seen with this fall economic statement is the government commit to another $20 billion in spending, no fiscal guardrails. We've got debt and deficit increasing like we've never seen before in this country. Interest rates are continually uh, at a level where they become unaffordable. The other thing that I, I heard about was the, the impact of mortgage rates, uh, Madam Speaker, and, and how that's affecting Barry Innisville homeowners. I had one person, I was doing the Salvation Army kettle in Stroud, I had one person come up to me and said that their bank, a self-employed person, won't even provide them with a mortgage. They've had to go to a secondary lender, not at 4 or 5 percent, but at 9 percent. They're going to be at risk of lo losing their home. There's 900,000 homes in this country, Madam Speaker, that, whose mortgages are up for renewal over the next three years. And as a result of this fiscal policy of this government, 
many are at risk. Conservatives are going to be focused on four things this session of Parliament. Number one is axing the tax. Number two is building homes. Number three is making sure that we help the government fix the budget with suggestions that are going to do that. And number four is stop the crime, Madam Speaker. There's only one alternative to govern in this country, and that's Canada's Conservatives, so that we can have common sense for everyone and restore common sense and decency for people in this country. Thank you. Questions and comments? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary, the Government House Leader. Yeah, uh, uh, Madam Speaker, and again, I want to reinforce, you know, they have this, they used to have the triple, triple, triple. Now they have the, the four priorities that they're trying to the, to sell Canadi Canadians on. You know, it's, it's the government expenditure one that really worries me. <clears throat> That's the hidden agenda item. We know one of the hidden agenda items is in fact... I'm just going to stop the Honourable Member. There seems to be conversation going back and forth, and, and, uh, 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 and then I actually heard somebody yelling as well. So I would just ask members to please be... Rec I just want to ask members to please be respectful. If they want to have conversations to take it outside, if they just want to try to make a comment, they should wait till it's questions and comments. Uh, the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Yes, Madam Speaker, one of the things that we do know is that the Conservative Party is going to cut, get rid of the Canada Infrastructure Bank. Imagine, that's $10 billion. Yeah. Uh, of government money, along with twenty. Sir, I just, I just, just. So I'm sorry. I'm gonna. I, I just uh, indicated that if individuals want to ask questions or make comments, they need to wait till the appropriate time to do that. So I'm sure that if they were the ones that were having uh, the opportunity to be asking a question right now, they would ask for that respect to be afforded to them, and I would hope that they would afford that to uh, whoever has the floor at the moment. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Yes, Madam Speaker, I'm talking about the hidden Conservative agenda in which one of the things that was leaked out was to get rid of the Canada Infrastructure Bank. We're talking about billions and billions and billions of dollars across this country, Madam Speaker, that is going to have a devastating uh, impact in many communities. For example, in rural Manitoba, where internet hookup is actually being enhanced through the Canada Infrastructure Bank. My question to the member is, why is the Conservative Party so determined to get rid of the Canada Infrastructure Bank. Honourable Member for Barry and this bill. Well, I think Canadians were sold a uh, bill of goods with the Canada Infrastructure Bank, uh, Madam Speaker, because uh, I don't believe that it's $10 billion. I believe it's much more than that. Sure. And the fact is, $35 billion, in fact, that the, uh, the, the amount of projects that have been built, I mean, if he, if he wants the answer, I can give him the answer. Madam Speaker, $35 billion. I question the Honourable Member how many of those projects have actually been built and how much has gone towards executive bonuses. So the Infrastructure Bank, look, it's no secret. He makes it like it's some dark secret that we're going to cancel the Infrastructure Bank. Maybe we'll put in a better program, or worse yet, maybe we'll balance the budget by, by as, as the, as the Honourable uh, Leader of the Opposition has said, with a dollar-for-dollar dollar, uh, scenario. And every household does that. If I'm going to spend a dollar here, I'm going to find a dollar of savings here. And after all of the consultants, all of the wastage of spending, all of the corruption that's gone on with this government, I'm sure we'll be able to find many, many dollars to help fix the budget, Madam Speaker. I'm certain of that, in fact. The Honourable Member for Terrebonne. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I respect the colleague who just spoke, so I will appeal to his intelligence. Quebec already has its cap-and-trade system for emissions, and that system works. Quebec decreased its emission from 2015 as compared with uh, 1990 levels, reduced by 8 percent, so it really is working. So if my colleague believes that climate change exists, that's not always a given in his party, and if he believes that we should fight climate change and if my colleague believes that w there are economic advantages to decreasing carbon emissions, as Quebec has demonstrated, then why is he so opposed to economic tools that clearly work? Bill. I think, Madam Speaker, uh, look, we're going to strongly disagree on this issue. There's, there's no question uh, that there will be strong disagreement between the way the bloc feels, in fact, the ideology of the government. We happen to believe that clean Canadian energy is the answer, and clean Canadian technology is the answer to reducing climate change, not just here at home, but around the world. You know, 
Madam Speaker, I, uh, I happen to meet with a European Union representative who his primary focus is to source clean sources of energy. And what they said to me was that Canada has become an unreliable partner in that because of ideology. We have the best environmental standards in the world, the best uh, 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 human rights standards in the world, the best labour standards in the world, the best technology in the world to supply the world with clean Canadian energy. If we're not doing that, right, rather than ideological attacks on our energy sector, if we're not supplying the world with clean energy, then who's supplying it? Russia, Iran, Venezuela, and others? We're gonna disagree on this, Madam Speaker, and I don't think it's an idea, it, it, well, I mean, it may be an ideological thing, but the fact is that we have clean Canadian energy that we can help reduce emissions, not just here at home, but around the world as well. Thank you. I uh, have time for a brief question. The Honourable Member for Nanaimo, Lady Smith. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you to the Member. One thing I never hear from the Conservatives, Madam Speaker, is about the importance of ensuring uh, that the rich and CEOs are paying their fair share of taxes. And this is something that my NDP colleagues and I have been... Um All right, I'm just going to uh, pause for a second. I'm just wondering if the Honourable Member's earpiece is too close to the mic, maybe? There seems to be some feedback. Uh, feedback. Um, so we'll try that again. Okay, the honourable member for Nanaimo, Lady Smith. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Second time's a charm. Uh, so I was wondering if, uh, if, the, if the member, Madam Speaker, could clarify why we're not hearing anything from the Conservatives around uh, CEOs and the rich paying their fair share. Um, ultimately, I'm not hearing a strong plan from the Conservatives. Um, specifically, I'm wondering with the current plan. It's not mine. I think it's just. <laughs> It's because the lights aren't on, uh, are the ones that are lit are not quite lit the right way. Uh, there is some feedback, um, again, like an echoey this time. Um, so, okay, I'll allow the Honourable Member to restart, and then I will allow the Honourable Member for Barry Nisville to answer. Let's try that again. Uh, I, the lights are not, there we go, we've got it, and hopefully the sound will be okay this time. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Speaker. What are the Conservatives going to cut if they're going forward with their proposed plan? Uh, what services, at a time when people are struggling, are they going to be cutting? And why are they not getting rich uh, CEOs to pay their fair share? Thank you. Wow. The Honourable for Barry Nisville. Well, Madam Speaker, I think it, I made it very clear in a previous answer, and uh, Conservatives have made it clear, that we're going to do what every household does, and that is if they look to spend a dollar, they're going to find a dollar of savings. I mean, single moms, families, uh, those moms who are going to bed worried every night about keeping a roof over their head, what do you think they're doing? And there's no reason why government shouldn't be living in the same manner. And so, you know, the Leader of the Opposition has made it very clear what our plan is. Look, we know that there's wastage. Uh, we're seeing it with the $54 million Arrive Scam app. We're seeing it with billions and billions of dollars being spent on consultants. Our focus is going to be on ensuring that working families have hope and opportunity for the future, not just for the next generation, but generations to come. That's our focus, and we are, uh, as I said earlier, we are determined and we are uh, extremely focused on that task.